Hello and welcome to our podcast on supply and demand. Ideally, you've seen the podcast on both of these economic factors as they were recorded individually. Now we can go ahead and put them together and see how the interaction of these really shapes the free market system. So let's go ahead and see what we're talking about. Just a quick review, remember that demand is from the consumer's or the buyer's end. And we define this as a willingness and an ability to actually buy stuff. That is demand. And again, this is from the potential buyer's end. And you can see in the bottom right the demand curve of how the demanded quantity is related to price. The higher the price, the lower quantity is going to be demanded. The lower the price, the more quantity that would be demanded. And then the other we're looking at is supply. This comes from the supplier's end or the producer's end. And this is the amount of stuff that can be bought and sold. So for example, if I think I can make more money selling something, I'm definitely going to make more of it. If I fear that my product's time has passed, I'll probably make less of it because I don't think I'll make very much. Additionally, if there is a product out there on the market that many companies think that they can all make money on, then we're going to see a huge supply of that product in the market. For example, cell phones in generic. Many people seem to want cell phones, and so many companies feel they can make money on that part of the market. So many companies make large amounts of supply of that product, all hoping to make a little bit of profit for their own companies. In the bottom right, you can see the typical supply curve also. And again, we have quantity as it's related to price. If the price I can sell something for is very low, then I'm going to have very small quantity of that. I'm not going to make very much of that product because I can't make much money on it. But if I find that I can make a lot of money on a product, I'm going to make a lot of those items in order to maximize the potential profit. So here we have the demand and supply curves overlaying each other. And so we'll typically call this the supply and demand curve. And you can see across the bottom we have quantity or the amount of something being made. And on the vertical axis we have price. And so you can see both the demand in purple and the supply in orange and how they are overlaid on each other in order to look at a particular component of the market. And so it becomes obvious that these two graphs will intersect with each other in a typical supply and demand graph. And so that point where those two things intersect is what we call equilibrium. And you can see the Latin root of equa or equal in there that basically means things are the same. And so this is the point on the graph where the demand that has been placed on a product based on what people want to buy and at a certain price is pretty correctly aligned with what producers are actually supplying. And so it's a delicate balance in the market for producers to figure out or anticipate or even create demand in consumers and then be able to supply the correct amount of product to meet that demand most accurately. Because you can see if we go beyond equilibrium on any one of those parts of the graph, then somebody isn't getting the best deal on that product. And since both sides of the supply and demand curve are still dominated by self-interest, and both sides still want to get the best deal for themselves, and both sides want to make maximum profit, both sides want to find what's best for them, but still have to work with the forces on the other side of who they are. So suppliers need to work with the consumers in a way, and consumers need to kind of go with what suppliers have in order for each side to be potentially happy. And if we have happiness on both sides of the equation, that is equilibrium. And so again, why do we have this delicate balance going on? If both sides are self-interested, like we've said before, and self-interest comes in the form of a desire to make profit, then both sides have to kind of work together or the curves become out of whack. Think about it. What if a company thinks it can make a ton of money on a certain widget? So it makes a whole bunch of supply for it. Well, they've still spent money in order to produce that widget. They then hope to sell it for a higher price in order to make a profit. But what if all of a sudden, for whatever reason, any of those factors we've talked about on the demand podcast, what if demand changes? What if all of a sudden people don't want that widget anymore because it doesn't solve their needs? It causes problems. It's proven environmentally irresponsible. 
or any number of various reasons why demand might change. If a supplier is left with too much supply, they're losing out on the potential of profit. The flip side, what if a company makes a new widget and they don't understand how amazingly awesome this is and how great it's going to sell. And all of a sudden, the demand for that is through the roof. People think, oh my God, this widget is amazing. It practically cures cancer. And all of a sudden, the demand goes through the roof. And the supplier, unfortunately, has not made enough supply to keep up. Again, they are missing out on the potential for profit because they could be selling millions of these. But if they only made 100 because they didn't think it would do very well, then they are missing out on potential profit. And so what or who exactly determines that equilibrium point? Why is it not here? Why is it there? Why is it at this point of intersection and why not somewhere else? In essence, in a free market system like we have here in the United States, the market decides. It becomes this unstated competition between buyers and sellers where both are in it for themselves, both trying to get the best deal. And this is what Adam Smith called the invisible hand. No government is telling a company, you must sell this product at this price. No government is telling a buyer, you must pay this for this item. Buyers and sellers in a free market economy are allowed to buy and sell for whatever they want, but they are going to try to look out for themselves. Buyers don't want to pay too much, and sellers don't want to sell for too low a price. And so as they negotiate back and forth, as they haggle back and forth, as more and more people buy certain products from certain competitors, then a market price becomes kind of established. And so it kind of settles in the middle and it settles at what eventually becomes called equilibrium. And so you heard me mention it within that last little part. That force that helps settle on a certain price or a ballpark of a certain price is competition. With competition, which is allowed and encouraged in the free market system, if more people feel they can get into that market in that area and make money on it, then they're going to do that. But then they're going to be in competition with other suppliers. And so that's actually really good for us as consumers because it helps the idea of equilibrium become more crystallized, more clear. Many of us buy products from Amazon. Same kind of thing. If we're looking for a book, we want it new or used. We want it shipped in a certain time frame. We want it in a certain condition. There's going to be multiple options for us. All of these different sellers are competing with each other for us to buy their version of that book. And so you can see, you could buy it for $17.86 at the top with free shipping. Interesting. But its condition is used. But it's pretty good. And they seem to have a lot of positive reviews. Okay, well, maybe I don't want to pay $17.86 for this book. I could move down a little bit farther and pay $13.89. Interesting. But it's $3.99 for shipping. So that's actually a little bit more than the other one. And it's in a used condition, but it's only acceptable. Maybe it's a little bit older, a little bit more beat up. But that seller gets 95% positive comments. So here we have four or five different suppliers trying to sell the same product. And one consumer, me on the other side, trying to debate, who am I going to buy it from? Again, no one's telling me I have to buy this at all. Nobody's telling me which one I have to buy. I'm completely free to choose whichever one I like. But you can see, most of the prices that these suppliers are, are listing are relatively close to each other. I mean, nobody's gonna try and sell this book all of a sudden for $5 because there probably wouldn't be enough supply to meet that demand. At the same time, they're probably not going to sell that book for $100 because nobody's gonna want it at that price. And so through trial and error, through just the way people shop, suppliers are going to price things more toward that equilibrium point. Where will their products sell? Where they will still make money. And so if suppliers want to make more money, why don't they just raise the price? Why don't they just change the supply curve, change the demand curve a little bit and adjust the equilibrium point? And the free market principle that keeps that equilibrium point where it does is the idea of competition. And so we understand the general concept of competition. We see it in athletics or contests or anybody striving to be better than somebody else, but it happens in the business world too. Businesses are out to make the most money for themselves, knowing full well that there are other companies out there that are in competition with them, 
trying to do the very same thing. For example, the companies of Walmart, Kmart, and Target all basically sell about the same kind of stuff. And so they're all in direct competition with each other. And so they're all trying to maximize their own profit without undercutting themselves too much and by being able to compete with the others in that part of the market. If they charge too much, people will go to the other competition. Why would I want to shop at Target if Target's prices are exponentially higher than somewhere else? If they charge too little in order to get people in the door, they may not make, be making enough profit and they may eventually go out of business. Either extreme is not in the company's self-interest, which is to maximize profit and maximize that profit for a long time in order to make a lot of money. And so the concept of competition, while it sounds kind of mean and nasty, is actually good for the demand side of the curve. It's good for us as consumers because it keeps prices low. Because if Target cranks up their prices because they want to make a lot of money, then people aren't going to go there and their competition will get that business and Target is run out of business. So Target has to keep their prices competitive with others in the market. At the same time, that competition is good because it creates incentives for new products to be made. If we continue to go to Walmart, and yes, we can pay lower prices for this mop, but the mop falls apart within 10 seconds of use because it's of significantly lower quality than the mop over at Target, then why would people wanna buy the Walmart mop that's gonna fall apart and have to buy another one at a cheap price why not just buy the one better quality mop at Target and pay slightly more? So the market kind of forces people to have a certain level of quality because that's the competitive part. If it's not good at store A, I'm definitely going to go to store B where my material will last a little bit longer. Competition also creates incentives for producers to make new innovations, to create new products, add better features. Because if we're not constantly innovating and creating this feeling of demand from consumers that they want to buy our product, then they're going to go to somebody else. The competition really pushes new innovations and pushes new creations from companies. But there are times where it can also push out certain companies from the market. In the 70s and 80s, the new innovation on the home viewing market was the idea of, of videotapes. Can I record something that's on TV and play it back later? Or can I buy or rent a mainstream movie and watch it at home? And as this new technology was hitting the market, there was great competition between Betamax and VHS. And so they basically did the same thing. They could record off of TV or you could rent something and then watch it at home. But as these two companies competed back and forth, basically only one could survive. Now I don't know the technological differences between a Betamax tape and a VHS tape, but for whatever reason, all of the market forces being in play, eventually VHS wins out. The size tape that we are used to seeing, that is the market. Betamax got squeezed out. They lost in that competition of that corner of the market. We could go on and on about many, many examples of failed businesses where in their corner of the market, the product or service that they were selling, new companies came into that same part of the market and entered into competition with them. And for whatever reason, many of these companies you see listed did not win in their corner. So the concept of supply and demand when looked at separately is a great way to kind of figure out how it works when they're put together. Because essentially, when you have a supply and demand curve together, you're looking at that intersection. That's the price that the market can bear on any one product or service. If either side goes too much to the extremes, an imbalance happens, and either side is not meeting its self-interest, which is out of profit. If I make too much of something, nobody buys it, I lose profit. If I don't make enough, I miss out on profit, I don't make enough. If I'm only willing to spend a dollar for a diamond ring, I'm not going to get it. From the consumer side and the supplier side, they kind of have to work together even though they're not explicitly working together in order to maximize their self-interest. So a somewhat complicated process, but if you look at this podcast, in addition to the supply and demand ones that are separate, I think you'll have a better idea about how these free market principles all work together. Thanks so much for watching. If you have any questions, please bring those into class. Otherwise, we will see you soon. Thanks a lot.